Hey, Skipper News Nation family, we're excited because we have an awesome guest on our show today. He's an explorer, a researcher, an author. Uh, so please help me welcome Timothy Alberino. Welcome. How are you? Nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Can you tell our audience who may not know who you are a little bit about yourself? Because we have a younger audience, younger than my dad's audience, which is is cool that we're reaching the generation that he always wanted to reach. But like, like in a, in a in a nutshell, what would you say that you are overall? I am uh, an author, researcher, explorer, filmmaker. Um, I've uh, I've written a book called Birthright. I produced a series of films called The True Legends, um, documentary film series. Uh, I've recently produced a new series, a TV series called Chasing Legends with Timothy Alberino. Um, and uh, I would also consider myself a ufologist. That is awesome, I dude. I think that covers all the bases. I always wanted to meet a, a ufologist because I, I always watch those shows or I have watched. I mean, it's on my on my desk. <laughs> like, I always found it fascinating and going to Roswell and all that stuff. And you know, that that's a whole different rabbit hole. But um, I'll get into some of these questions. Have you ever had a supernatural experience? Um, I think the short answer is yes. It's a very inter it's a very interesting question. Um, I have had things happen to me that are unexplainable. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I was 19 years old, I was living in the Amazon jungle, and I, I definitely, when I during that period of time, I definitely had some wild things take place that. I cannot explain in any kind of rational way. Uh, so I think that uh, that you you could you could classify that as supernatural. Um, I've experienced things throughout my life that you might classify as supernatural synchronicities and and. Um, trying to think of specific something specific that i could give you but the thing that what happened to me in the jungle is is very very um it's a very very long story and it's not particular particularly that interesting um and it's uh it's very convoluted so i want to i want to stay out of those weeds but the the short i guess i guess I was, the short answer was yes and then i went began to give you a longer answer so let's just stick with the short <laughs> answer yes i have do, do you believe that the supernatural beings can communicate like telepathically, like without even speaking? Well, I would uh, scruple with the term supernatural. Um, I kind of famously am not very fond of the term supernatural because I don't believe supernatural is a, it's a term that comes from the Latin so, sobrenaturales, which means above nature, beyond, nat beyond nature. And I do not subscribe to the notion that there is anything above or beyond nature in the universe except for the Father and His Son. Correct. Uh, yeah. Outside of outside of God, I would say everything is exists within exists within the natural world and and obeys the laws of physics. And I I would as an addendum to that, I would say that we probably understand very little so far of the totality of the laws of physics. So I do believe that there are facets of our reality that we, we simply cannot comprehend. I subscribe to a hyperspatial theory of the universe. In other words, there are more um, physical spatial dimensions than the three that we exist in plus time uh, and that those that our original progenitors, Adam and Eve, could perceive the totality of, of creation, of created order. So I do believe that there are ways to interact with this hyperspatial reality and that there's much more to 
um, the physical universe than, than we can perceive. And so some people would call that supernatural, but I would, I would be a little bit more definitive and describe that as hyperspatial. Hyperspatial. Awesome. I like that better. It sounds a lot better to the ear, in my opinion. Um, so here's another question that was kind of submitted to me. Uh, do you think that the face peelers are human or something completely different? Do you, have you done a lot of research on it? Well, uh, how familiar are you with the face peelers phenomenon? I'm, I'm at a basic level, so I'm not like an expert. So, so back last year, um, as many people know, back in early summer, mid-June to the beginning of July, there was this a series of videos that showed up on social media. And these videos were, uh, they went viral. They, the first videos that showed up were from a particular village called San Antonio de Pintuyacu, mm -hmm. which is in the Peruvian Amazon, in the region of Nanay, in the district of Nanay. And the videos and were, were filmed at night and they depicted, um, they depicted the villagers of San Antonio uh, in a state of, of panic and chaos, and they're they're running around the jungle discharging their firearms. And subsequent interviews reveal that they claim to have been uh, that they claim that they were being invaded by very strange beings. Some of the villagers, not all of the villagers, some of the villagers said that these were not human. These were non-human extraterrestrial beings. And the reason why they said that was because these invaders were, uh, were in possession, apparently, of advanced technology and had remarkable capabilities, such as they, they, they were able to float about a meter off the ground. They seemed to be impervious to gunfire. They were shot at point blank range, apparently without any effect. Um, and and they, they also uh, were flying on these circular disks, like basically circular hoverboards. And so this was exceedingly advanced technology and, um, or at least more advanced than than conventional technology, let's say, perhaps not as exceedingly as it might at first appear. And so uh, I went, I embarked on, a, a, on an expedition and I went to the village of San Antonio de Pintuyacu and uh, my friend Doug Thornton accompanied me and we conducted an investigation and we went in, we went in October. So things had calmed down by the time we got there and we, we conducted an investigation. I interviewed um, dozens and dozens of, of men and women from the village and they told us that these assailants were, they, as I said, they would, they would make an incursion into the village. They would come two by two and they would, they would usually come, uh, all, in fact, they would always come flying on these platforms, on these circular disks. And they would land the disks in the, in the jungle and then they would, they would walk or float into the village. And uh, many of the villagers had seen them, had had, had had up close encounters with these beings who they were calling face peelers. Mm -hmm. Now it's important to understand, and this is a very long winded answer to your question, but I think the, the backstory is important. It's important to understand that the face peeler phenomenon goes back to the eighties, not any further than that. It goes back to the early eighties, earlier mid eighties. Um, and it, it was always sort of a wives tale. I heard it when I was 19 years old living in the Amazon. So it's sort of like a boogeyman type figure. They, the, the parents would tell their kids, be careful if you go out at night because the face peeler might get you. Right. And the face peeler, the face peeler was considered by the, and these are indigenous communities, most of them out in the jungle. The face peeler is considered by some in the communities to be gringos, uh, human traffickers, uh, organ harvesters, and by others to be completely non-human, to be aliens even, some will tell you. If you enjoy my analysis on these topics and would like to hear more from me, 
I invite you to join the El Barino Analysis members community, where you will gain access to my weekly private briefings, live stream Q&A sessions, behind the scenes updates on my current projects and expeditions, community features that facilitate interaction with myself and other members, early access to tickets for events I happen to be conducting, and a convenient mobile app to keep you notified and up to date on everything I publish. In addition to all this, annual subscribers will be treated to an advanced screening of three episodes in a TV series I've been working on for several years. These films alone are worth the price of admission. The El Barino Analysis Members Community is the best way to connect with me and support my work. If you would like to become a member, you can find a link to the subscription page in the description of this video or visit theelberinoanalysis.com. I hope to see you in our community. And the reason why it's the reason why they're described by some even in the village of San Antonio de Pintuyaco as being non-human is because they have these very bizarre capabilities. They don't move like normal human beings apart from the fact that they that they fly into the villages, you know, surfing on these hoverboards like the green goblin from Spider-Man. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yes. In fact, that's what the that's what the 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 villagers of San Antonio de Pintuyaku were were likening these assailants to the Green Goblin from Spider Man, precisely because they would be flying on these hoverboard craft, and also because they were covered in 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 body armor head to foot. So they were covered in black uh, bo uh, armored body suits, and they were wearing helmets, and so. And, and they were capable of, of, as I said, remarkable feats. One, one lady told me that she, she witnessed one of these people, one of these assailants, jump over a hut, jump over a house. Wow. And another guy told me that they were pursuing one of these face peelers at night. A group of guys were pursuing them through the jungle. And he said the way that this person moved was, was inhuman is what he told me. Now, again, some of the villagers believe that they're dealing with uh, organ harvesters, gringos, uh, who are there to organ ho ho harvest organs and specifically the face, to cut the face off of their victims for whatever reason. Others believe that these cannot be human beings, that the technology is simply beyond conventional techno human technology. And so... Um, the, the question to who the face peelers are is an open question. I, having conducted the investigation, myself and Doug Thornton, we are of the mind that these are human beings in possession of unconventional advanced technology, perhaps technology derived from extraterrestrial sources. The reason why I say that is because apart from these armored body suits that they're wearing, which are bulletproof, um, perhaps even mechanized. We might be looking at some sort of an exoskeleton, exosuit, right? Right. Um, we, apart from that, apart from the, 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 the platforms that they hover on, that they, that, they, um, that they fly in on, they are also apparently in possession of what can only be described as, as advanced aerospace vehicles. Several of the villagers drew these vehicles in, this, in the dirt for me. One of them uh, drew, drew one, of the, the, one of these advanced aerospace vehicles on, a, an, on an acrylic board. And they kind of have an a acorn shape. They're narrow in the front sort of delta shaped in the front and then they widen out in the back but they're not tri triangular they're 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 not triangles they're sort of uh, rounded in the back and uh, this particular gentleman who drew the the craft on the on the acrylic board he told me that one day while they were experiencing these incursions by these mysterious assailants the face peelers that he was pulling up he was pulling up his nets at about three in the morning in the river and suddenly he said it was like somebody turned the lights on like the sun had just come up wow. and he said that um he saw a bright light reflecting in the water he looks up and about 30 or 40 feet above him is this craft just hovering silently above him and the craft 
uh, is it's transparent. He said it had a transparent mesh. So you could sort of make out the, the, the shape of the craft because there's, there was, it had some form of material that was transparent or semi-transparent. And you, and you could also make out two individuals inside of the craft. One was sitting sort of in front or in the cockpit area and the other one was sitting in the, in the middle of the craft. And it hovered silently over him for some time and then it began to move away uh, and when it began to move away, it made it made a humming noise, a, a low frequency hum. Oh, and before it began to move away, it, it 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 had sort of like these little stubby protrusions on it, and those protrusions opened up, and and they when they opened up, they deployed a series of blinking lights, rapidly blinking lights, as if it was scanning. Wow. And uh, there were no propellers, there were no engines, no conventional. Uh, propulsion systems to speak of. And it, sh it should be noted, by the way, that the people of San Antonio de Pintu Yaku, um, they are the Akitu tribe. They're the Akitu community, a very important old uh, indigenous community in the Peruvian Amazon. And they are living on the edge of a vast wilderness. I mean, north of this village is just Amazon, uninhabited Amazon. And uh, so the government, the provincial government, established a communications outpost there. And so the so the Quito people in the village of San Antonio have access to satellite internet. And so the reason why this is important is because all of the villagers or most of the villagers in San Antonio are watching the same movies as all of us. They're watching the Marvel movies. They're watching the Spider-Man movies. That's why they made a reference to the Green Goblin. They're very, right. very familiar with pop culture. They know what airplanes look like. They know what helicopters look like. They know what uh, drones look like. Um, even some villagers have drones. They, they have um, drones in the village that they play with. And so these are not um, primitive indigenous people who don't know what a helicopter is. In fact, Helicopters are, are frequent in the area because the military is flying helicopters over the jungle looking for um, looking for drug traffickers. And, and small aircraft are constantly flying over. While I was there, Cessnas were flying over. So these people are very well versed in conventional technology. And so when they describe a craft that hovers silently, no propellers, no jet engines, no noise, you can believe that they're they're giving you an ac accurate description of something that is not a helicopter and that is not a, con a conventional aircraft of any kind. And that is real. It's and real. that is absolutely real, physical craft. And so whoever these face peelers are, they are in possession, as I said, of advanced aerospace technology. And it's important to highlight one particular case that we investigated while we were there. It was a young girl named Talia, 15 years old. And Talia, there was an attempted abduction of this, of this young girl. And in fact, the police came to investigate. They had a Navy escort, the police, that came to the village and investigated this particular scenario. And they, after, when they finished their investigation, which was just a couple of, of hours, they concocted a very, very um, absurd story. They said that the villagers were being assaulted by miners, river miners with jetpack technology, which was absurd. Mm -hmm. But what happened to Talia was one, so let's frame this properly. The village has already been, uh, has already experienced an, a few incursions of these face peelers, of these strange assailants. And so they're on, they're, they're alerted, right? To, the, right. to, to, the, to these happenings. And so, so there, there's a high, there's a high, there's a state of vigilance. And Atalia, one evening, just after dark, she's picking fruit. By the way, let me pause for a moment and say that all of this can be seen on my YouTube channel. I did a video of the investigation. Uh, we filmed it with GoPros. So if you want to see these things that I'm talking about, you can go to my YouTube channel, Timothy Albarino. And actually check that watch. out. Check that out. It'll be in the description. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, and so <clears throat> Talia is picking fruit from her in her backyard and you have to you have to understand that her backyard it's kind of in the middle of the village there's this forested gully with jungle in it and 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 it's they're surrounded by other houses in the village 
And so Talia's in the backyard. She's picking fruit. She knocks one of the fruit down to the ground, one of the fruits down to the ground. She bends over to pick it up, and she notices that the, there's, the leaves are rustling around her feet, and she feels a gentle wind at her back. So she turns around, and she realizes that this wind is being, is being caused by one of these assailants who's flying up to her on surfing, basically. And she, she made, you know, she... She she gestured in like this, saying he was s surfing up to her on one of these hoverboards. He surfs up to her and lands right behind her and grabs her from behind. He covers her mouth with his, with his hand, and he and he secures her. And then she sees another guy, another assailant, um, coming up uh, behind this one, and he lands in front of her on his hoverboard and he grabs her legs. So so she is now completely. Um, captured by these two face peelers let's call them and their the description is exactly the same as the other villagers they're dressed head to foot in black armored body suits they have helmets on that cover their whole faces they have um uh they have almond shaped eye lenses that some of the villagers described as having a yellow tint others described it um as having more of like an uh greenish tint and she says that uh they were armored you know, but not not all of the suit was armored. They had patches of armor, and they lifted her off the ground. And she said, when they when they after they grabbed her, they touched their boots, the sides of their boots, and and it energized the technology, these hoverboards. And they lifted off the ground, and they carried her down into the gully behind this um, thatch roof chicken coop, and and then they proceeded to take out some cream smear some cream on her face they sh they injected a some sort of a substance up her nose with a nasal syringe and uh, this was some sort of a sedative and it had an immediate effect on her and then they began to, to to smear some cream on her face and and after they did this they took out what what she described in what we think is a laser syringe and they began to cut make an incision under her jawline now it is it's important to note here as well that Talia says that she heard them speaking during this during this assault. She heard them speaking. And she said that when they were applying the cream to her face, one of them said to the other, "Be careful, don't apply too much or you're going to ruin the flesh." And so when they began to cut, when they began to to make the incision, she started to struggle because she knew what was happening. Obviously, she's beginning to panic. Right. But she is in a in a um, she's she is in a semi sedated state because of whatever they shot up her nose, mm -hmm. and she starts to struggle and she starts to push up on the guy that has her from behind, who she calls the Gringo, by the way, because he had an accent, a Gringo accent, mm -hmm. and she starts pushing up on his helmet. And he's afraid she's going to see his face, so he lets her go momentarily. They drop her momentarily, and in that brief space, she is able to scream. And she screams at the top of her lungs. And as I said earlier, the town, the village is already in a state of vigilance. So when she screams, her brother, who's sitting on the porch, and some of the other men who are sitting on their porches, they come rushing on the scene. They're on the scene very quickly with flashlights. And when, when, Ta when Talia screams, the assailants um, realize that, you know, the, that they've been, um, that they're going to have some company. And so uh, the one assailant lifts off on his hoverboard and starts to move away. And he yells to the other one, come on, let's go. We have to go. We have to get out of here. And, and, the one that's still holding on to her, which the, who she calls a gringo because he was a little larger. By the way, these guys are about, they're, they're taller than me. Everyone says they're about six and a half to seven feet tall, but that might be because of this exoskeleton that they're wearing, this suit. Right. Um, and he says, no, we can't just leave her here. And he, he proceeds to drag her by her hair. So he's floating on this hoverboard, dragging her, almost as if he's going to try and lift off the ground, holding her by her hair. And obviously he can't do that, so he has to let her go. And so she's, she's. They dragged her halfway up the hill, and and this is this this is the scene that the that the brother and the other villagers find when they get on scene. They see, and they told me this. They described this the scene. They saw. They they train their flashlights on these assailants, and these guys are just sort of hovering on their boards. They 
maneuver over to where there's an opening opening in the trees and they shoot up into the air at a high rate of speed on their wow. boards. And Talia is there on the ground, bloodied, and they're able to uh, to rescue her and uh, they bring her down to another village for some medical treatment. Talia, by the way, her face was swollen for a week. So whatever this substance they put on her face, it left it swollen for a week. They were definitely gonna cut her face off. Oh yeah. Um, uh, or attempt to cut her face off. So that adds color to this whole scenario, some resolution. And I, and this is one of the major reasons why I think we're dealing with human beings um, in possession of advanced technology. Wow. Do you think it, uh, like the Miami incident has anything to do, uh, is any similarities to this face peeler thing? Because I think that's what they called them when they, when it first happened for face peelers. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of the Miami incident. I'm not sure if it was real, if it was a psyop, um, if it was an imagined thing. I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I heard from um, some some individuals who claim to have been on the uh, police department, members of the police department who were on scene and said it was completely overblown, it was nothing. And then I've heard from other people who claim to have seen tall alien beings. Uh, so I don't know. There was a lot of hysteria surrounding that, that whole incident. Um, I was told by one of the officers that, um, that they were running a routine drill that evening and they were responding to an incident at the, at the mall and they decided to, to use it as a training exercise, but who knows? I mean, um, I do know that there was a lot of hysteria surrounding that event, and I'm always very cautious when I see hysteria right. because it's psychological. People, um, it, it's, it becomes a, a psychological phenomenon, and it sort of takes on a life of its own. So I'm, I'm very cautious. I, I, the, I do not know um, if that was a real event, a staged event, a psyop, or an imagined event. I, I, don't, I don't know. Jeremiah, on that same topic, hi, Timothy, by the way, I joined you here a little bit late. Uh, it's uh, great to be on here with you. Um, uh, I wanted to add to that question is comparing the Miami incident with what happened in Las Vegas, the family that had the, uh, that were slightly recorded in the back of their yard, um, yes. comparing those two events, one seems to definitely have a lot of, uh, overblown enthusiasm to it um and then one does seem like something actually happened uh what were Which your thoughts on the las vegas incident okay so the the las vegas incident is very intriguing to me here's why it's intriguing because first of all you you have on camera on the body cam footage of the officer you have something coming out of the sky definitively okay that's not in question something came out of the sky and the neighbors heard it impact. Um, uh, so that's that's the first thing to consider there. The second thing is the the family described very large beings, you know, nine, ten foot tall, and that original footage that came from the film crew, the news station that showed up on the scene, and you'll recall that they they're interviewing the family, and then they begin to walk towards the backyard. And as they're doing this, they, they, they say that, you know, we can't, it's private property, we don't want to film their backyard or whatever they said. And they shut the camera off when they were going, you know, approaching the gate. But I believe that they inadvertently captured the being or beings that were in, the, were in, that, in their backyard. And, and as everyone is familiar with now, I'm sure these this family, their backyard is not a typical backyard. They have forklifts back there. And I think they work on cars or something like that. And there was this forklift and they actually said, when they called the police, they said that the, the being was behind the forklift or it, or if that wasn't said in the, in the 911 call, it was said to the, uh, uh, in the subsequent interview with the channel, I, I can't recall. And so somebody took that footage before the camera was shut off that brief glimpse that you had of the backyard they and they they slowed it down they stabilized it and i believe there is authentic footage of a very large nine foot tall um 
reptilian no rather let me back up man manted mantis like entity and when i say mantis like entity i'm i want to be more specific it's what i would describe what david jacobs describes as an insectolin which is an entity with a bulbous head very large insect like almond shaped eyes very 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 small mouth mm -hmm. um and there is some footage which i do believe is authentic and i could be wrong but it is my assessment that the footage is authentic indeed it is the footage from the uh news channel that night in which you see this creature ducking behind the forklift and i know that there was a bunch of videos that popped up online at the time that were trying to show this or that something behind the fence I don't know about those. I've seen them, and I, I don't know what to make of them. So some of those look completely fake to me. But I have this gut feeling, and that's all it is, that the, the that the footage that highlights something behind the forklift is in fact real. And I find that to be very intriguing because when I was uh, in on, on expedition in Peru last summer, investigating the face peeler phenomenon. Uh, some of my most of my investigation occurred deep in the Amazon in the village of San Antonio de Pinto Yacu. But I also wanted to go to the city of Nauta, which is not that far away. And it's it's so it's southwest. So it's south uh, east of San Antonio de Pinto Yacu. And it's about an hour, hour drive, 40 minute drive from uh, the city of Iquitos. And I wanted to go there because there was a video that surfaced in June or early July. And it was sort of the same kind of a scene as in San Antonio, as in the village. But this one was from Nauta. And it depicted a bunch of people running around, panicked. One guy had a flashlight in his hand and, and, he, and, he's, flat, and he's training the flashlight on something up in a tree above this house. And it appeared to me in the footage that what we were looking at could be could be a being of some kind that would have fit the description precisely of of the being in the Ve the beings in the vegas incident and it had a large bulbous head you could even see and all again all of this is on my youtube channel in the, in the, in the videos that i produced about this you could even see eye shine from what appear to be large black almond shaped eyes and so i wanted to go to this location in the day to, to during daylight hours to get an idea of the of the scene and to uh you know make a further assessment of whether or not that it's could actually be some sort of a creature in this footage and so we we found the location we went to nauta and talked to some locals and we were able to find the location and we filmed there with GoPros. And what was very uh, interesting to me was surprising, actually, was that the trees in the background, the, the tree where this entity seemed to be, seemed to be in this tree, that tree is actually, you know, some 30, 40 feet in the background. So it's not right above the, of course, this video was at nighttime, low resolution, so it's hard to make anything out. But in the daytime, it was very clear that these trees were very tall, very large trees, and they're in the background. They're not right above the house. And so if, in fact, if, in fact, there's a being, an insectolin type creature in that footage, it would be nine or ten feet tall. Enormous. Wow. Just like the creatures described in the Vegas incident. So I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm very intrigued with the Vegas incident. I do tend to, to, to think that that was real. I don't know. I can't say definitively. I do tend to believe that that one was real and, and that and the, and certainly the stuff in Peru, because uh, in Nauta, interestingly enough, I interviewed the neighbors, by the way, right there around that house. And I was told that they had also been experiencing this, the same sort of incursions that were happening in the jungle in the remote vi village of San Antonio de Pinto Yacu. Nauta is a, is a, San Antonio de Pinto Yacu has about 200 inhabitants. <coughs> Again, community, this is the Iquito community, but Nauta 
Nauta has about 36,000 inhabitants. Nauta's a city. And they were experiencing the same kind of incursions on the outskirts. And even that very night when this footage was taken, the neighbor told me that they were they heard gunshots going off on the outskirts of the city. And she, one of her neighbors was one of the guys on patrol on the outskirts of the city, and he was coming back with a shotgun. And she said, what, what was that all about? What was happening? And he described the very same assailants, these guys flying on discs, surfing on discs, dressed in black armored bodysuits. But what's really interesting is that uh, during this period of time, mid-June to mid-July, let's say, um, the, the neighbors saw on multiple occasions in this same location in Nauta, flying saucers, discs hovering over these trees. And, and they told me that the discs like they 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 um, deployed some kind of a light down straight down through the tree one time, but she they drew it on the ground for me, and it was it was a classic saucer, and so something very 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 strange is going on, and both uh, in Peru and I think I think the Vegas thing, so I, I really don't know what to make of all of this exactly, but I do. The, the Peru thing, I'm 100% convinced is real, 100% convinced. Um, there was a boy not far from Nauta. He was living in a village. I think it's called Bagasan, not far from Nauta. And this is a smaller village. And this boy was rushed to the hospital because they found him with, with very deep lacerations under his jawline, just like Talia. But these lacerations were deep. It was like somebody cut fish gills in the kid's neck. And, and this was, I think, a 13-year-old boy somewhere in there. And there's footage of this. And I posted footage of this on my, uh, on my Twitter account, on my ex account. And the boy uh, says that he was assaulted by the face peelers dressed in the black armored bodysuits flying in on the discs. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how um, he was rescued or, or what, what the circumstances were, but they were able to bring him to Nauta, and thank God they, they saved his life. But there's literally um, footage of this boy, because in Peru they don't blur stuff on the media like we do here. They actually show all the gory stuff, their, their media. And there's footage of this kid sitting in the hospital room. He's got like these fish gill lacerations just hanging there, bleeding, and he's in a state of shock. Wow. And they thank God they were able to, to sew him up and, and get him some blood and save his life. Um, but that had happened not not that long before I had arrived to Nauta. So something very serious is going on in the Peruvian Amazon. And is it related to the Vegas thing? I have, a, I have I, again, it's just a gut feeling that I have that it is. Wow. Well, when you were describing the, the initial beings, the ones that are in the suits, it reminded me of the, the Calvin Parker uh, story. Are you familiar with that one? I don't think I am. Uh, they, they were like uh, fishing. It was him and a guy named Char Charlie Hickerson or Hickson. And they're fishing and a craft that kind of you described appeared over them and abducted them. And they described these beings that were in a suit. And, you know, it, it's just the whole story blew my mind. And, I, and when you were describing it, I was like, that sounds oddly familiar to that story. But Sadly, uh, Calvin Parker's no longer with us, but he'd be a fascinating person to interview. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I'm very, very interested in anyone who's had experiences similar to these. Um, it, subsequent to my, my expedition in Peru, um, a, I, was a, I, was given in, I was given a lead by, um, uh, by a, a, someone on Twitter, a certain Twitter account, I'm trying to remember the name. I think, I think the name of the Twitter account is Peru Alien Attacks, who wanted me to, to, to make a phone call. They, they had contact information for a man, for a young man in a village near the city of Yurimaguas, which I'm very familiar with Yurimaguas. Yurimaguas is southwest of, of the Nanai area. And he had his cell phone number. And so uh, who he had a, apparently had an, a face peeler encounter. So I called Pablo. His name was Pablo. I called Pablo. 
and had a conversation with him. And Pablo says, he tells a very, very wild story. He says that one day they're on this homestead outside of the city of Yurimaguas, and which is still proving Amazon. And he's bathing in the river. And suddenly he hears people yelling in the homestead, face peelers, face peelers. By the way, face peelers in, in Spanish are called pelacaras. And so he hears them saying, face peelers, face peelers are here. And so he runs, he comes running out of the river, grabs a towel, puts a towel around his waist, runs into his hut and grabs his shotgun and a flashlight. And he goes out to where all the commotion is and he sees the, he sees the assailants again, black armored bodysuits. They were not on the discs. They, they were walking and he begins to pursue them with his shotgun. He takes a shot at them and then he, they start, they, they take off running into the jungle. He's pursuing them. There were two of them. And he gets close enough to them in this pursuit that he is, he's, he discharges a shotgun again and he hits one of them. And by the way, when they hit these guys, they, I was told this in San Antonio, as well as by Pablo, you can hear the bird shot because you're using 12 gauge shotguns. You can hear the bird shot dinging off of the body armor. And, wow. and he said he, he thinks that he, he damaged the technology because the one guy took off into the air. He lifted off into the air. But the guy he shot, the assailant he shot, was having a trouble lifting off into the air. And so Pablo, realizing that he likely damaged the technology, sprints over to the guy and he tackled him. He grabbed him around the waist. The guy didn't go to the ground, but he's got him around the waist. And as Pablo is holding him, the guy is trying to lift off into the air. And eventually he takes out the assailant, the face peeler, takes out some sort of a device. And Pablo described it as a laser and, and, and basically shot Pablo with this laser, hit him with a laser. And it instantly incapacitated Pablo. He hit the ground and, and was out cold. Um, his father, I think his father and his brother found him laying on the ground and uh, and carried him back to, to the homestead. And ever since that moment, um, ever since that encounter, Pablo has had serious heart troubles. He went to a doctor and the doctor said, whatever happened to him, it, it messed up the rhythm of his heart. The timing of his heart was totally screwed up. So Pablo now has a heart condition and he's on uh, pills. He's on heart pills. So um, that that's a interesting uh, dimension of, of it adds an interesting dimension to the uh, face peeler phenomenon. Uh, what do you think they're they're using the faces for? Uh, do, do you have an opinion on that? I I believe that I have my sense is that whoever these individuals are, they're using the face peeler legend as cover for something else. And the reason why I think that is because, you know, if they're face peelers, they're really not very good at their job. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seems to me that something else is going on in the jungle. It, it should be noted, and I, I always, I always forget to, uh, to pull my notes up here and, and, and remember exactly the name of this, um, the name of this military operation that was happening last year in Peru, there was a military operation. It was a joint operation. It was a training exercise between several South American countries and the United States and the UK and those South Amer and it was based in Peru. So it was Peru, Brazil, Uruguay, Ecuador, a handful of South American countries. And the United States, almost every branch of our military was there. The Marines were there. The Air Force was there. Space Force was there. Wow. The Navy was there. And all of the equivalents of these uh, uh, armed forces from the United Kingdom were also there. They had battleships going up the Amazon. They they were conducting some kind of operation. And again, I'm trying to, I'm scrambling to see if I can find the name of the operation. Um, I always forget it. And I cannot remember the name of the operation, but there was this military operation. So um, 
I suspect that that either the military is is testing advanced technology on some of these when i say military it would be united states military is testing advanced technology on these villagers or this operation was a cover to combat something that's actually there to combat some sort of a group um that's deploying this advanced technology for whatever reason so i think that the face peeler legend that all of the in ind indigenous communities know about everyone living in the jungle knows about the face peelers is being used as a cover for something else to explain why people are seeing these individuals uh, these these mysterious assailants on these hoverboards and 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 why people are you know, when they're describing the acorn shaped craft, you know, it's, it's just being associated with face peelers. So it's very convenient. It's a very convenient um, cover, I right. think. Now, are these actually the face peelers that have been engaging um, these communities for, for decades? They, they very well may be, perhaps they are. But I've got a feeling that we're looking at um, the phenomenon, the legend being used as a cover for some other activity happening in the Amazon. Right. And every time you say, uh, every time you say hoverboard, I think of back to the future because I'm a huge back to the future fan. Do you think there's anything that connects time travel with these UFO sightings and, you know, are they connected at all? Do you think? No, I don't think I, I would say no. Um, but I don't know. I think time travel is theoretical. I personally don't think it's possible for several reasons, but, um, I don't know. I, I, I would have to just speculate about time travel. So I don't personally think there's anything to do with that here. Now, it's important to understand that the hoverboards that these guys are flying around on are circular. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't make any noise. They're silent. And uh, the only time they make it, the villagers say the only time they make any noise is when they lift off the ground initially. And it's like a, it's like a burst of air or like a compressed air kind of a sound. And it'd be like but, the ground other moving. Other than that, they're, they're silent. Yeah. And they can hover in place and they're very dexterous the guys they're very they're, they're very agile on these things they can weave in between trees on these things now with the uh the topic of a force being located in the uh jungles there in peru our audience will be very familiar with the concept of uh the nazis uh landing in argentina setting up communities and of course we have the connection with project paperclip and a lot of the kind of extraterrestrial things that started to happen in the united states after the nazis were brought over to the americas uh, and so my question would be is there any correlation between the holdover escapees from world war ii that landed in argentina set up their own communities and possibly bringing the technology that they had established uh while working uh in nazi germany um, and what we see here with, you know, a possible uh, holdover of uh, some of these recluse, uh, either government societies or, or possible, uh, you know, just hidden hidden groups that have this technology. Sure, that's possible. Um, you know, most people are f familiar with the Gleitsch, the bell, um, that the Nazis were were experimenting with nobody really knows what the heck that device was but we've had similar devices like that crash crash retrieval type situations in the united states with apparently the bell look, look just like it and that was in the aftermath of uh, operation paperclip um so i think yes certainly we we brought some nazi technology over here the nazis had uh diagrams of very interesting aircraft that they were um uh, that apparently were experimental craft that they were working on some of which are flying saucers and they claim to have um um both uh uh Werner von braun and i believe his uh his uh mentor is it oberth i think his name was oberth uh said that they had help in in the rocket program and what they were attempting to do they had help and that help was not 
human beings. It was some, it was in their estimation, it was extraterrestrials with aliens. And, uh, and, and apparently they contacted these beings through the Maria Orsic and the Vril maidens who were these occult practitioners in the Vril society. I, we all know that the, the Nazis were steeped in the occult. Mm -hmm. And the Vril Society was one of the one of the occult organizations that uh, many of not not of the Nazi members were part of, were members of. And the Vril maidens were these psychic women who had very long hair, and they believed that the, their long hair helped them in was part of the mechanism of contact with these non-human entities. And so, yeah, the, you cannot separate the Nazis from the occult, and you cannot separate the Nazis from experimental advanced technology. That, that ended up in the United States, some of it. And we, we obviously know that, you know, we would have, we would never have had a rocket program of our own without the Nazis. We brought them over and they were our rocket program. Um, NASA was founded uh, um, to, uh, to some extent to buy these paperclip scientists, or they were fundamental in the foundation of, of NASA. They were, they were, um, it was their research that that really f that really framed um, the the technological experimentation and the rocketry of the various programs that NASA was developing. And, uh, and I am curious: uh, after your expedition to Peru, what are you looking at now? What what is your current project, or or what are you uh, working on now? Um, we're going to bunch of stuff. Um, I'm actually very, very fascinated by Bigfoot phenomenon here in the United States. So I'm going to do some Bigfoot stuff this summer. But um, I've got various projects underway. I, I, I was filming a, 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 I, I created a film series with my uh, partner, Gary Haven, um, I've been working on that over the last several years, and, and um, um, I've got three episodes in that. It's really a TV series completed. Um, and then I've been um, working on various uh, literary projects. I'm actually in the process of uh, getting ready to publish my own edition of the Book of Enoch. This is a wow. proof copy. This is not the final version. Um, and uh, I'm doing this with... Uh, my friends Luke Rogers and Nate Henry from Blurry Creatures is sort of a co-op project. So I got all kinds of stuff going on right now. But in regard to investigative stuff, I'm actually quite. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm. There's a chance that I'm going to try and follow up on the Vegas stuff simply because it does seem to be so closely related to what was happening in Peru. And I say was happening in Peru. It seems to have cooled down there, and it's it, it sort of migrated to. Brazil, the Brazil, the Brazilian Amazon, but and by the way, it's 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 been all quiet on the on the San Antonio front since I've gone there, and we when we went to San Antonio, um, I failed to mention that I I had, an, I had an fish I had an official invitation from the chief of the village, the Apu, and the uh, the village elders. I had an official invest, uh, invitation to come and conduct my investigation, and I. Doug and I equipped them. We we procured some strategic technology because the villagers of San Antonio were doing every night. They were uh, walking patrols with their shotguns around the village. They were getting very little sleep. They were very concerned. The people were so spooked that they were not going out to their uh, farms to harvest uh, their crops. They weren't they weren't going very far down the river to fish, and they were in need of certain supplies. So. Um, we kind of turned the investigation into a humanitarian effort at the same time. And I want to thank the guys from Conduit Church, uh, Pastor Darren Tyler and and, the, and Jamie Brandenburg and the guys from Conduit Church who helped me, who co-funded the expedition with me. And we were able to bring them, um, the village of San Antonio, we were able to bring them uh, food supplies and uh, medicine and also strategic technology. We brought them... Uh, night vision goggles with uh, recording capability. We brought them some thermal uh, binoculars. We brought them radios because, so they could communicate on their patrols. And we brought them high, high powered flashlights. And then Doug, who uh, was an infantry um, 
Marine and worked at the DHS. Uh, Doug and the Navy guys I brought with me, Peruvian active duty Navy guys, jungle commandos. I brought a couple of those guys with me as well, Peruvian guys. So Doug and these jungle and these uh, Peruvian Navy commandos trained the villagers how to conduct a military patrol and use the technology and integrate the technology so that we, we did that as well while we were in the village. And, and they've been doing it. They've been using the technology and, and so far they haven't had any more incursions. So uh, I know people are maybe wondering what's, what's the update there. That's the update. Um, it's, it hasn't occurred again. P probably maybe because the assailants understand that these guys are now very well equipped to right. film them. Night that's vision great. goggles with recording capability. So um, that's an important uh, detail there that I failed to mention. I love your research into uh, the cryptid topic and how you relate it to extra biblical texts such as the Book of Enoch. Uh, several years ago, I produced uh, a Book of Enoch audio dramatization. Uh, so it's close to my heart as well. And I wanted to ask cool. you about your thoughts regarding uh, these, uh, these extra biblical texts. In addition to First Enoch, are there any lesser known texts that you found value in? Yeah, I would say all of the Dead Sea, most of the Dead Sea Scrolls material are, are interesting and valuable in regard to Second Temple thought and, and the theology. Um, I wouldn't say that all of the texts are authentic or are, or are true, scientifically speaking. Um, even the Book of Enoch is, of course, there's three books of Enoch, but the, but the second and third Enoch were not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and were produced after the birth of Christ um, in the first and second centuries AD. First Enoch is kind of a convoluted text. And I would say that the, the, the earliest portions of First Enoch, namely the Book of the Watchers and the Book of Parables, are authentic. I think, I think they do reflect an earlier manuscript, or at the very least, oral tradition that has come down to us from the antediluvian world. And indeed, it's, it is possible that the earlier portions of Enoch do come from an original manuscript that was penned by the hand of Enoch himself. Um, Tertullian, the church father, uh, believed that that, that that could have been the case. Um, but the book of Enoch, the latter portions of the book of Enoch, um, I should say that the earlier portions, the book of the Watchers and the book of Parables, were certainly unquestionably written before Christ, which is important because the book of Parables contains some of the most remarkable Christological prophecies, messianic prophecies anywhere in the biblical or extra biblical texts. And indeed, those prophecies are referenced by Jesus of Nazareth. For example, he calls himself the Son of Man. Well, that, that um, appellation, the Son of Man, is never employed anywhere in the Bible as a, as a formal title. Anywhere, except for by Christ in the New Testament. There's one one um, uh, one time that 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 the Son of Man is used in the Old Testament is in the Book of Daniel, but Daniel is not using it as a title. He's using it as a descriptor. He saw one like a Son of Man, but the Book of Enoch talks about the Son of Man, a formal title, and this is of course the title that Jesus preferred above all others. And he had a handful of titles he could have used, messianic epithets that he could have employed in regard to himself. And he chose to use Son of Man, which is, is, is a direct reference to First Enoch, to the earliest portions of First Enoch. So um, there, as I said, there's Christological content in, in, the, in the parables more than anything that knowing, un, knowing that it was, it was certainly written, published before the birth of Christ, it provides us with, with, an, with a, um, with, with a self-authenticating mechanism because it accurately predicts and prophesies things about Jesus of Nazareth before he was born. And we know that the Bible tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so I think that the book of parables and the book of the watchers are authentic. 
The rest of the book of Enoch is interesting, first Enoch, but I think that uh, it's uh, the, the, the further chapters, the further sections, not chapters, sections, were written after Christ and certainly are sprinkled with um, chariot mysticism or Kaaba. So uh, I think First Enoch is a very um, complex document, manuscript. Um, I, I've, I find the Book of uh, Giants to be very intriguing. Although the Book of Giants, as you well know, I'm sure is, very, is highly fragmented. So it's very difficult to derive much out of it. I mean, you can kind of get a, an understanding of the, of the story, Manway the Giant. A lot of it revolves around Manway and his interaction with Enoch. Um, is that folklore? Is that historical? I don't know. Um, but, but we can say that the Enochian tale is, was not considered to be folklore by the, by the ancient Hebrews. It was considered to be veritable history by the ancient Hebrews. Yep. So I'm not sure that, that that can be said of the other, um, the other scrolls, such as the uh, Genesis Apocryphon, for example. Um, the Book of Giants, though, is, 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 is a fascinating document, highly fragmented. It's sort of, a, in, it elaborates on the story of First Enoch. I'm not sure what the dating is on the, on the Book of Giants. Of course, you have the War Scrolls. You have, you know, various, various uh, Dead Sea Scrolls that are, that are valuable, highly valuable in regard to understanding Second Temple theology. Um, and uh, and certainly the Book of Enoch, you know, there are so many references to the Book of Enoch in the New Testament. Um, dozens and dozens of direct references to the Book of Enoch, to First Enoch. And that, that, that will come as a surprise to many people. I wrote, by the way, in my edition of the Book of Enoch, I provide the, an introduction and commentary. And um, I think people will find the introduction pretty interesting. Um, but it, it is... Uh, so yes, I'm, it's a very long-winded answer. I apologize, but yes, I, I do think that the Dead Sea Scrolls are very valuable, and some of them I think are historically authentic, but not all of them. I think just the implications of the Book of Enoch as text to be considered both by the Jewish and Christian communities is uh, enormous. Um, for one, we know that the Jewish community is. Uh, unwilling to consider texts that are not written in a Semitic language as possible scripture. Um, and that's so right. that's why the Jewish community discounts the Book of Enoch, because, uh, you know, we have the, the copies that were preserved in the Ge'ez language in the Ethiopian. I, I was going to ask you, um, you know, as an investigative journalist uh, and, and somebody who really can dig into some of these topics, I have heard rumors that a complete Aramaic copy of the Book of Enoch was found in the Dead Sea Caves, but it was attained by a private collector. Yes. What are the odds of finding out where that yes. ended up? And and I mean, I'm so hungry to get hands on that or, or for somebody to be able to discover that text because an Aramaic copy and being able to compare that to the Ge'ez and all the translations we have today exactly, would be yeah. enormous. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure the Ge'ez has... Uh some modifications, um, some alterations. But, and the reason why I say that is because, and yes, before I forget, yes, there, there is rumored to be a microfilm that the copy of, 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 a full copy of the Book of Enoch and Aramaic, it's in a private collection, um, allegedly, and there is microfilm copy, a microfilm copy of it as well, I've heard. Uh, now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, the, um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, so we know what we do know unequivocally is that the early church fathers had a copy of Enoch that is no longer extant. It's it's gone because it is not entirely reflective of of the Enochian of the uh, Ethiopian Enoch. Um, the early church fathers quote from the Book of Enoch, and those quotations are nowhere to be found in the in the Ethiopian manuscript. So maybe they're in the Aramaic one. Um, so it's, you know, people, you know, should have a very high resolution perspective on the book of Enoch. It's not either it's true or false or it's biblical or under, it's not like that. It's complex. It's convoluted. Um, and uh, it needs to be handled as such. But uh, yeah, I, I do believe there is a full 
Enochian manuscript out there in, in, in Aramaic. And, 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 and it would be very intriguing if indeed it were in Aramaic. Yeah, I think it, it would really do a lot because of the um, the evidence of of Christ recorded in Enoch being written before Christ's time as a reflection of the prophetic nature and the fulfillment that the Messiah had, but also it, the the correction in modern church doctrine that the book would have if the modern Christian church were to consider it as scripture as well, uh, challenging theories like the Sethite explanation of Genesis 6 and such, uh, which, which I mean, really on both, both fronts, both the Jewish community and the Christian community, having a further validation of that text would be enormous in terms of furthering our understanding Certainly. of ancient history. Sir, I would say that the Hebrew cosmology validates the text. The ancient Hebrews believed that story was well known. It undergirds so much of the Old Testament. And uh, I and it is my contention that, or my suspicion rather, that the the reason why the Jews rejected the Book of Enoch in their canon was precisely because of its remarkable Christological content that is <laughs> that is pointing directly to the man they crucified. So uh, that would be, I think, the major contention among the among the Jews at the time it was it was in people if you've if they've read the parables in first Enoch and Ethiopian Enoch they'll understand what I mean some of them probably the most precise uh, prophecies regarding the Son of Man regarding Jesus yeah pretty pretty much uh, any doctrines that are gone from the book of Enoch such as the origin of demons for those who are watching I'm, I'm adding this information of course you know this but for those who are interested in the book of Enoch, it covers on how the manifestation of demons can be traced back to the disembodied spirit of the Nephilim, those beings that were never intended to exist, but That's came right. about through the mating of fallen angels and, and the women. Um, mm -hmm. And there's several other, you know, explanations on the nature of Sheol, the grave. And, uh, and of course, exactly you know, right. we have um, <laughs> direct quotations in the New Testament uh, from the very first chapter, in fact, of the book of Enoch. Verbatim. Um, verbatim. Uh, you know, Jude. Verbatim. Verbatim. Um, and you yeah. have, for example, so, you, have, uh, you have allusions. You have allusions to the book of Enoch. J Jesus says, for example, in my house are many mansions. Right? Uh, or in the Father's house, he, 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 re he references the Father's house having many mansions, rather. In my Father's house are many mansions. Where does he get this from? Where is mansions in heaven in the Old Testament? The answer? nowhere guess where it is guess where it does it is referenced the book of enoch mansions in heaven are specifically referenced in the book of enoch so jesus is not drawing only upon the tanakh he's drawing upon uh other scrolls and i i would contend that the book of enoch uh that the scroll whatever it was called the, the you know maybe it wasn't called the Book of Enoch, whatever it was called, the Enochian tale, that that scroll was in the synagogues in the first century AD. It was in the synagogues. And that it was, it was, it was probably considered as sacred scripture. And that's not to say that the Ethiopian version is exactly that scroll, as we said earlier. Um, it was, you know, the Ethiopian version is, I think, contains some of what might have been in there, namely the Book of the Watchers and the parables, um, with some Merkaba uh, elements added in later on. So uh, it's it's a fascinating topic because there's you know there's so much contention around this. Um, people saying, well, it, it, it's not in the canon, so it's it's not valid. But but you can't really say that because you cannot take away. You cannot take this component of Hebrew cosmology away, remove it from the picture, and still understand much of what's happening in the Old Testament, specifically Genesis 6. The reason why the author of Genesis, whether it was Moses or someone else, does not elaborate on the Genesis 6 affair is because it was already thoroughly chronicled elsewhere and well known to the audience well known to the ancient Hebrews. They already knew this story. He's just making reference to what was already known. And that's why there's no elaboration. So when he mentions the Son of God, and as you well know, the, 
the, the verse, which paradoxically is also in Genesis, uh, Enoch 6, chapter 6, that verse about the sons of God seeing the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and desiring them, that's, that's almost word for word, word right out of Enoch. So I think that the writer of Genesis is, is copying from Enoch, is literally is referencing a document that's older than Genesis and, that, and, and a story, at the very least, an oral tradition that was ubiquitous, that was very well known among the ancient Hebrews. And when you get to the New Testament and, and you find you know, so much of what Jesus is saying, he's referencing the Enochian messianic prophecies, and you lose that, you don't understand uh, some of the reaction of the Pharisees, for example, and the Sadducees, when Jesus is saying certain things about the Son of Man, because he is claiming to be not a son of man, that son of man from the book of Enoch, from the messianic prophecies in Enoch. He's claiming to be that son of man. If you understand what that means, you begin to have some insight into why the Pharisees and Sadducees were so upset with him. It wasn't just because he was claiming to be God. It was because he was claiming to be the son of man from the parables of Enoch and everything that entails and uh, it's there's and it's not just Jesus. It's not just Christ who references Enoch. The apostles are referencing Enoch. Uh, and there are, again, it's not just once or twice. There's dozens and dozens of these references, and then also uh, portions of Enoch that are that are pasted verbatim in the New Testament. So um, I'm not. I, I don't uh, care. Uh, I can care less whether or not Enoch is, canon is canonical. That's, that's, that's irrelevant to me. I'm only interested in, is it true? Are portions of it true and authentic? Was this considered to be veritable history by the ancient Hebrews? And the answer, the answer to that question is unequivocally yes. The ancient Hebrews absolutely believed that the story, the Enochian tale of the watchers descending the earth, copulating with women, that that story was veritable history. And again, it undergirds so much of Hebrew cosmology. It's, it's, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an irreducible uh, piece. It's, an, it's, an, it's, a, it's a, an essential piece of Hebrew cosmology. You cannot remove it or so much of uh, Hebrew cosmology um, becomes, uh, it, it, it's, it's, the foundation is the story to so much is the Enochian tale to so much of Hebrew cosmology. And if you were to move it, it's like a Jenga tower. So much just collapses. It doesn't make any sense if you remove the Enochian tale out of the equation. So that's a clumsy way of saying that. But but uh, that's it's it happens to be true. Well, I think that's so profound out the significance of the son of man claims that the Messiah was making in regards to. Uh, the Pharisees and, and the people of that time were likely very familiar with this text, the Book of Enoch, and, and it really does highlight uh, that this was a well-known understanding of the past, uh, and, and it even adds more significance. I've never actually thought of that myself, so very profound that you, you, know, you were sharing that connection with his claim to be the Son of Man, as according to the text that uh, they were probably considering in those days, the Book of Enoch. The um, Son of Man is the great judge in the book of Enoch. Yeah. So he's the one who's going to preside over the judgment of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father. I mean, uh, and that's why Jesus says, when you see the Son of Man see coming with the clouds of heaven, everyone thinks that's just a reference to the book of Daniel. Oh, no, that's a direct reference to the Son of Man multiple times in the book of Enoch in the parables. So uh, yes. I think that's why the... That's why the high priest tore his robes, because Jesus was claiming to be that son of man. He was also the son of God. Wow. Wow. Uh, and uh, I only had uh, two final questions, and Jeremiah, I guess, um, if you had any other, we could uh, conclude. Uh, but my last two questions uh, were in regards to uh, with your study into uh, Genesis 6 and uh, Nephilim, I know there's uh, 
varying uh, theories. I wanted to ask you specifically on your thoughts on the late Rob Skiba, Jeremiah's dad's theory, starting on Nephilim appearing after the flood. I, I know there's uh, the, the position of a second incursion of the angels coming down. Um, and I know Rob is that, that it was through the wives of Noah and the transfer of the Amazon DNA through the, the, the wives of Noah's sons. I was, I was wondering your opinion on that theory that Rob had talked about over the years, if you'd ever well, considered that. I, I, um, I, I do not believe in a second incursion. Um, I think it's, it's illogical. The first incursion was so monumental and is so well documented. Why is there nothing, literally nothing, zero about a second incursion anywhere? N nowhere. It's nowhere to be found anywhere. Um, not even in the mythos of, of, the, of the pagan nations. It's always about the golden age when the gods walked among men. Zeptepi to the, to the um, Egyptians, right? It was this period of time when the gods descended and dwelt among men and, and uh, copulated with human women and their hybrid offspring governed the earth. Uh, that's the golden age. It was, that was the incursion. And there is no second incursion anywhere. So the, the, why would such a monumental event go without mention in regard to a second incursion? It makes no sense. So I, I totally reject a second incursion um, uh, hypothesis. Now, in regard to uh, the, let's say, the genetic markers of the giants, of the Nephilim, making it through the flood, through the embedded in the genomes of, of Noah's why uh son's wife specifically ham's wife i think um i think it's plausible i think it's definitely a plausible scenario and it and it and, it, and it's a it's a good option um and but this all depends there's other options as well i think that's a plausible one certainly there's other options as well it all depends on how you view the flood and you know, Western Christians only really have one way that they view the flood, lay people, not scholars, because that's a different, totally different thing. Most Western Christians view the flood as this universal aqueous cataclysm uh, and that, that covered every square inch of ground underwater, like Mount Everest was underwater. That is the traditional view, and it is certainly possible. However, it's not the only view. Uh, there, you, you can make just as strong of an argument from the biblical text for a local flood, uh, which is, I would say, maybe 40%, maybe even 50% of scholars subscribe to a local flood now. Um, and you could make just, in the same way you can make that strong argument for a local flood, you can make a strong ar argument for a global cataclysm with catastrophic flooding. So... There's, there's at least three different ways to understand the flood. And again, some people will say, well, no, that's not true. It's, it's, it's plain in the text. My Masoretic Bible tells me this, and this is what it means. Not really. It all depends on how some of the words are, are translated, and it depends on how the meaning is interpreted by those translators and, and understood by us, the readers, Western readers, reading an English version of a very ancient Semitic document. So um, there's, as I said, there's just as much room for a local flood interpretation or a global cataclysm interpretation in which there was catastrophic flooding. And if, if it is a global cataclysm or a local flood, then um, the, it, the answer is quite simple there were Nephilim outside of these areas that were that were totally devastated. Um, so, and you know, that's a long conversation and, and I know people, I get up in arms about that, but, but believe me, there is plenty of good scholarship supporting local, a local flood, uh, specifically a local flood uh, hypothesis. I'm open to I, any of them. I am totally open to any of them. The only thing that I think did not happen is a second incursion. Uh, because there's there's no mention of it. There's no there, there's there's you know such a monumental event surely would have been documented somewhere by someone, right? And it's just not there. So um, I do believe the genetic uh, uh, the 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 genetic transference of those 
uh, markers, those, those genes of the giants coming through uh, the line of Ham, Ham's wife is plausible. I'm open to that, certainly. Um, and I'm also open to a local flood or my favorite hypothesis, which is a global cataclysm um, hypothesis of the flood. So um, I'm just, I'm very open to, 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 to several things, several possibilities. One problem I have with a global flood, well, again, I'm totally open to a global flood that covered the, the every square inch of ground, Mount Everest is underwater. I'm open to it. I'm not close to it. I'm open to it. I used to think that way. That used to be what I thought uh, about the flood. But now I'm agnostic because there's a problem that I cannot surmount with the idea of every square inch of ground being covered in water. And it's simply this. And maybe this is a very elementary thing and maybe there's an answer. You know, the Bible talks about all of the land animals that draw breath dying. But what of the sea creatures? There, were no, there weren't fish tanks on the ark. So how do you have the survival of freshwater species? And, and, and conversely, how do you have the survival of saltwater species, aquatic species? You cannot take, you cannot catch a bass in a pond and go throw it in the ocean. It won't survive. It's not a saltwater breathing fish. Um, and you can't take um, a, a, an ocean fish and throw it in a pond and expect it to live. These are different environments. They're equipped to live each one in their own environment, whether it be saltwater or freshwater. Uh, you do have um, some fish like the bull shark that can live in brackish water and they, they can swim up the Amazon. Um, but most species can't do that. Most aquatic species cannot survive in those environments. So what happens when you dilute the salinity of the water and you have this brackish environment, which you would have had, in a global flood that covers every square inch of the ground, how do any sea creatures survive that? Um, that's a big problem. So, and it's one problem that I have, one, one issue that, uh, and maybe there's a very simple answer, but you know, the point is I'm open to um, a number of scenarios and I think people should be open to the idea that there is just as much good scholarship behind a local flood as there is behind a global flood. And then if you, subscribe to a local flood, then you have several, you have at least one more option as to, as to how the Nephilim made it to the other side. But again, let me back up and, and reaffirm, I do believe that that uh, that the genetic transference through, through Ham's wife is plausible, absolutely is plausible. That, that's very interesting. And I know there's also the, the third option, uh, which is the rabbinic commentary of Akabashan holding on to the top of the ark. Um, is there you uh, go. a rabbinic. Uh, that's right. Topic. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's like tornadoes where he is. So. <laughs> well, this yeah. is probably a good idea for me to jump. I got to jump. I'm out of time. But. Uh... It's been a really fascinating conversation with you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we'd love to have you back. And uh, thank you for coming on Stephen News Nation. And where can our viewers go to find out more of your, your work? TimothyAlbino.com. You can go to my um, YouTube channel if you want to see the footage uh, that I was referencing, that I was talking about there, my expedition. We filmed it. It's on my YouTube channel. Awesome. Timothy Alberino. I'm on X and Instagram. My handle is always the same, Timothy Alberino. And I would like to mention that I've recently launched a members community and uh, where I've uh, where I talk about all kinds of things. It's uncensored and it's sort of like my own social media platform. That's at the elberinoanalysis.com. And by the way, those I mentioned earlier that I was uh, that I was working on a film project, a, a TV series, people who sign up for uh, annual membership, the, the the first three episodes of that TV series are included in the annual membership. You get a pre-screening uh, of, of those episodes. So you can sign up at the Albreenanalysis.com if you're interested in the members community. That's awesome. And when Jake's back in studio, we'd love to, to, to do this again and, and explore so many different other topics. But uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure having you.